What is going on guys? Welcome to this Python tutorial series for machine learning. In today's video we're going to start out with neural networks and we're going to cover the theory of how ordinary feed-forward neural networks work. Uh, and basically this episode is just a theory and in the next episode we're going to complete a project uh, in which we recognize handwritten digits with neural networks. So in this episode we're covering the basic um, understanding of neural networks. So what is a neural network? How does it work? How is it structured? And so on. So let us get into the explanation. So let us talk about how a neural network is basically structured. Now, what we have in a neural network is we have multiple layers of so-called neurons. So these circles here represent neurons. And we have multiple layers, not just a couple of neurons, and that's it, but we have multiple layers of neurons. So let's say we have, I don't know, four neurons here. Then again, four neurons here. And in the end, we get like two neurons. So what we have here first is the so-called input layer. So this is where the data that we have gets put in. So the training data, the testing data and all that. And then we have an output layer. This is the last layer here. And this output layer is basically our result. For example, if we try to classify something, we input all of the values in here in this input layer. And in the end, we get a classification. If we have two neurons, we could get a probability of how much it's class one and a probability of how much it's class two. Or we could also have just one output neuron with a regression. Basically, the output is what we know as the output all the time. We just have a result, a classification, a number, a value, a prediction. And the input is just the uh, features, the feature values that we need to get the output. And in between here, we have so-called hidden layers. So these hidden layers here are adding, um, are adding complexity and sophistication to the model. So these are the hidden layers. And in a neural network now, in a ordinary feed-forward neural network, what we do is we connect every neuron of one layer with every neuron of the next layer. So it looks somewhat like this. <clears throat> Now, I'm not going to draw all the connections here, but you have to imagine that every neuron here is connected with every other neuron of the next layer. Or actually, I could just draw all the connections here. It's not that much work. So basically, every neuron of the input layer is connected to every neuron of the second layer. And then we have the same thing here. We have every neuron of this layer being connected with every neuron of the next layer. And it goes on and on until we reach the output layer. Basically, just all the neurons are connected. And in the end, we have the output. Now, we're going to talk about uh, what these connections and neurons do in particular, in detail. But for now, just know that we have an input and an output. And the hidden layers are doing something. We're going to talk about uh, what they do in a second. But they're just doing something to get to this conclusion. So in a sense, these neurons and connections here are random at the beginning. So we could just say they're random. They don't have any functionality. And we just feed in our data. And in the end, we get a result. And if we do supervised learning here, we have some training data to put in here. Training feature data. And then we have the training labels. So these would be the results that we were expecting. So for example, we're going to classify handwritten digits if I expect to get an 8 in the end, but the model outputs, of course, with two neurons doesn't make a lot of sense, actually would have 10 different neurons for each digit. And if the most activated neuron is the neuron for the number 2 or the digit 2, we would say, okay, no, that's not true. We need to adjust the model. We need to adjust the neurons and connections in between so that we get the right result. And we do this with a lot of training examples uh, to train our model, basically. And the input layer is just, in the case of handwritten digits, would just be the pixels. So we have basically a uh, 28 pixels times 28 times 28 pixels um, handwritten digit, for example, of an 8. And this means that we have 784 pixels, I think. So we would have an input layer with 784 neurons. So we're, we don't have just six neurons like here, we have 784 of them. And all these neurons are connected to a hidden layer, another hidden layer, maybe even another hidden layer. And in the end, we get the output layer. And all these points, all these neurons, all these connections need to be 
changed in a certain way so that they fit the training data. And then we can use all these connections to feed in unknown data and get the right result. This is how we use neural networks to learn. So now let us talk about the individual neurons and how they work. So every neuron has a uh, certain input and this input could be either the input of the input layer, so the direct training data, or it could be the output of another neuron. Now I don't have too much space here to draw another neuron, but basically the output of one neuron, if this is a hidden layer, uh, could be the input of another neuron, or actually is always the input of another neuron, at least in the feedforward neural network. Um, so the input gets fed into this neuron, and then this neuron has a certain activation function, let's call it A. And this activation function determines what happens with this input. So this input gets processed by the activation function, uh, and then basically tells us how hard, uh, or actually not how hard, uh, how bright our neuron is, how much activated our neuron is, how activated our neuron is. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. So for example, if the input is one, we could feed this input into a function and this function produces, I don't know, an activation of uh, 0 0.9 or something. Depends on the activation function. Um, or we could also use just the basic perceptron model, which is outdated, nobody uses it anymore, uh, with the bias, basically just taking the input and subtracting the bias to calculate the activation. Uh, this is the most primitive form of a uh, neuron, the perceptron, just having a bias that you subtract from the input. However, this neuron then has outputs unless it's in the last layer, because if it's in the last layer, we just have the activation and this is the result. Uh, but every neuron, if it's not in the output layer, has an output. And this output is the input for the neurons in the next layer. So what happens here is we have again the same process. We have then other act or maybe the same activation function, maybe other activation functions that then again produce a uh, different result, results that get fed into the next layer then until we reach the output layer. Now, what's important here is that every connection that we see here has a certain weight. And this weight determines how important the activation of this particular neuron here, so of this neuron here, is important for the next neuron. For example, maybe the activation of this neuron is very important to this neuron, so this weight will be kind of high. Maybe the activation of this neuron is almost irrelevant for the activation of this neuron, or should be almost irrelevant to the activation of this neuron, so we will say this weight is very low. And of course, this is not something that we do as developers, this is just what the neural network does. So when we feed training data in there, it tries to adjust these weights and uh, in order to, to, to create a model that works. For example, if I feed in an eight and it sees, okay, no, it's a two, um, or basically it classifies, us at a, it classifies it as a two, uh, but it's an eight in, in reality, so it feeds back this information to adjust these weights so that the next prediction will be a little bit more accurate. And we do this with tens of thousands of examples of training data to make these weights accurate. So we have a bunch of different activation functions. For example, one activation function would be the sigmoid function, which basically just um, does something that looks like this one here. So it basically takes, I mean, not exactly that. Let me do this a little bit more accurate at least. Uh, we have the one here and the zero here and the function, the sigmoid function, what it does is it more or less transforms every input value into a value between zero and one. So we don't get negative values. So if I get negative, uh, I don't know, if my input is negative 8,000, the result, the activation here will, will be something like 0, 0.0. 0 point, uh, okay, not two points, sorry, 0. 0.000. 0, 1 or something like that. And if I get plus uh, 90,000 or 9 million, I don't know, I will get like almost 1. So I would get 0 0.999997 maybe. So we don't get any value that's above 1 and we don't get any value that's below 0. Now another activation function would be the ReLU function, which stands for Rectified uh, Linear Unit. And what this does is it basically just says, okay, if the value is negative, we're going to say zero. And if it's positive, we're just going to return it. So basically just the maximum of zero and the value, the maximum of zero and the input value. So if I have an input value of, 
uh, minus 6, I'm going to return 0. If I have an input value of minus 10, I'm going to return 0. If I have an input value of 23, I'm going to return 23. So basically just returning the value, unless it's negative, then we return 0. So this is how the individual neurons of a neural network work. So now, last but not least, let's talk about something called the gradient descent. And the gradient descent algorithm is the algorithm that allows our neural network to be optimized. Uh, because, as we already said, while training the neural network, it has to adjust the weights and biases and all that in order to produce better results. So what we do is we basically have our input neurons. In the case of the handwritten digits example, these are 784 pixels that uh, each pixel has a value from 0 to 255, indicating how black it is or how white it is. So 0 would be, I think 0 would be total black and 255 would be totally white and everything in between is gray. And basically we feed this through a neural network. We have the hidden layers here. And in the end, what we get is we get 10 output neurons that tell us how likely it is that this digit is the solution. And let's say we feed in an image of uh, a two, for example, then we would want the neuron here because this would be zero, one, two. Uh, we would want this to be a one, which means 100% sure. And then we want all the others to be at zero. This is the ideal case that we want. Uh, all the other neurons to be at value zero, zero probability that this is another number and 100% sure that this is two. So this is basically what we want this is the desired output. But of course, this is not the case. We just feed in data and maybe it ends up something like, I don't know, 0 0.33, uh, 0 0.12. Then here it says 0 0.01, totally wrong. And because of that, we just compare the values and we come up with the so-called loss function. So this loss function indicates how wrong our model is. It's not the same as the error because the error would just be the uh, percentage of misclassification. So how many uh, of them were not classified correctly, but the loss function tells you how much you're off the desired results. And this loss function produces some value. For example, if the loss is, I don't know, 96 or 9,060 or 9,633, this is a huge loss and this is a very bad model. So in the end, you might end up with a loss depending on the loss function of, I don't know, 1.2, which would be maybe a decent value. And our goal is, of course, to minimize that loss function. So what we do is we want to minimize the loss function. I hope I can delete everything here with, OK, I cannot. So I'm going to just use a fancy square here. Paint is king, I'm telling you. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize that loss function because, of course, if the loss is low, that means that our model is performing very well. And basically, this loss function tells us when we input the weights and biases and the desired outcome, it calculates how wrong we are. So uh, imagine the loss function to have uh, the parameters, weights, biases, and all we need, all the parameters that make up our neural network, and in the end, the desired output. As I said, this is not uh, to be taken too seriously. This is not like the accurate mathematical description. I'm just using this as an exercise here. So imagine you have some mathematical function that takes in all the weights, all the biases, all the parameters of the neural network, and then also the desired outputs, and then compares um, the actual results with the results that, uh, that we should have. And this loss function has a certain form. And let's say it looks somewhat like this. Of course, no loss function on this planet looks like that because uh, it would be too simplistic and it doesn't make sense to have a loss function like this. And let's say we're somewhere here on the loss function. Now, what we want to do is we want to adjust weights and biases in such a way that we reach the minimum of this loss function. We want to roll down with the ball, basically. We want to use an algorithm that allows us to just roll down the slope to reach the valley of this function. And of course, a loss function not only doesn't look like that, but it's also uh, in, in very uh, high dimensions because, of course, we have, I don't know how many weights, I don't know how many biases, thousands of weights, thousands of biases. And of course, the loss function is not just uh, a two-dimensional graph. It's like a, I don't know, thousand-dimensional graph or something like that. So it couldn't be plotted like this but it's good for visualization. So basically we have some point where we are and we wanna go to that value. 
Now, how do we do that? Basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize, we're trying to roll down. So to roll down, we need to go into the direction of a steepest descent. So when we take the gradient of a function, this is a little bit mathematical here, don't uh, freak out about it. Uh, when we take the gradient of this loss function, it basically tells us which direction we need to move to make the highest increase. Now, what we're going to do now is we're just going to negate this to find the opposite direction, which of course gives us the, uh, the way down, which gives us the direction in which we decrease the function, uh, the function's output the most. And of course, in two dimensions, this is like either this direction or this direction. But of course, if we have three dimensions, uh, you don't only have uh, like two axes to go. We have three axes to go into. Uh, or three directions that you can choose, and that adds up to a lot of different uh, directions that you can uh, end up going in. And of course, if you have 50 dimensions, this makes everything more complicated, so uh, you cannot visualize this anymore. But basically, we're just looking for the direction that we want to roll down into, uh, and then we take a tiny step into that direction. I'm going to call it epsilon here. So basically, we're taking the negative gradient and going down a tiny bit. And then we're repeating that and adjusting the weights and biases so that we end up in this local minimum. Now, of course, if the loss function, let me just use this square here again to cover this. Uh, what the fuck? Okay. Uh, if we have a loss function that's a little bit more complicated, maybe something, I don't know, like that. Uh, and we're somewhere like here. What happens using this technique is, of course, we reach this local minimum here. But of course, here we have a minimum and here we have a minimum that is lower than the local minimum here. And uh, because of that, we might choose uh, different starting points. We, uh, points. We might do some randomizing to start at different points to see what happens. But basically, the gradient descent finds the most optimal solution in the local minimum. And this is how we optimize the neural network. So this was the basic theory of feedforward neural networks. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it wasn't too confusing and it should be enough to prepare you theoretically for the next episode where we're going to use this knowledge and implement uh, a neural network in Python that allows us to classify handwritten digits uh, with this technique that I showed you today or with this uh, structure that I showed you today. So I hope you learned it and I hope it was helpful to you. So um, if this helped you, hit the like button to support this channel and also feel free to ask questions and give feedback in the comment section down below. And of course, subscribe to this channel if you want to see more free videos in the future. So thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.